Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. Today we'll have a situational update from Commissioner Morrison and an update on rivers, dams, white water, and wastewater systems from Secretary Moore. Over the last few days, I've had the chance to go out and look at some of the damage caused by last week's storm. While I know this storm doesn't have the impact and isn't as visible as last year's, where we saw the capital filled with piles of debris, the damage in the communities is significant. The morning after the storm, there were 54 state roads, eight state bridges, eight railroads, and two transit routes closed. Now to be clear, this does not account for town roads and bridges. As of this morning, there are eight state roads, six state bridges, eight railroads, and the transit routes are, and no transit routes are closed. I want to thank the team at AOT, local road crews and contractors who have been working hard to install temporary bridges, doing what they can to get roads open as quick as possible, and the teams at the Agency of Natural Resources who have been doing the same for water infrastructure, landslides, and more. As I mentioned on Tuesday, we asked for a joint preliminary damage assessment from FEMA, which is the first step to determine if we meet the threshold for federal support. FEMA arrived in Vermont yesterday, and they're working on those assessments for public assistance in nine counties. Addison, Chittenden, Essex, Orleans, Washington, Caledonia, Lamoille, and Orange. They're looking at damage to infrastructure, including things like roads, bridges, water lines, and wastewater treatment facilities. The public assistance uh, assessment is expected to be completed by Monday. And next week, FEMA will begin assessments on homes, driveways, and personal property to determine if we meet the threshold for individual assistance. If they determine we meet the threshold for a major disaster declaration, we'll make a formal request to the president, which will bring significant federal resources to the state. Even though we started the process for a declaration in some counties, we can add others to the request if there's enough damage. So please, if you haven't already done so, call 211 to report your damage. We've heard from communities who are worried about how they're going to afford to repair flood damage on top of other routine maintenance and projects they've already budgeted for. If we receive public assistance, that will help significantly, but we know that won't be enough in some cases. Regardless of the federal deck decision, we'll continue to do what we can to help those impacted, rebuild and recover, and remove regulatory burdens wherever we can. Before I turn it over to Commissioner Morrison, I want to say again thank all Vermonters who are stepping up helping their neighbors and communities get through this challenge. Mr. Morrison. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I will provide numerous updates on issues related to flooding on July 10th. First, let's talk about the weather. Dry and pleasant conditions are expected through Monday. Temperatures and the humidity are lower than they have been for the past couple of weeks. If you haven't already, now is the time to get any water or wet items out of your house and move all flood-related debris to the right-of-way. We will continue to work closely with our partners at the National Weather Service to monitor any changes in the weather that could impact Vermonters. Let's talk a little bit about debris. The State Emergency Operations Center is working with towns on the logistics of debris pickup and providing technical assistance to support towns as they create their local pickup plans. We anticipate that debris pile pickup will begin at the end of the month. This means you have this weekend and maybe next weekend to get your debris to the right of way. The goal is for the large debris trucks to only make one pass through each community. 
211 data. As of this morning, there have been 1,921 residential reports made to 211. There have been 207 reports of damage to businesses. There may be more damage out there, and we ask that you please report all damage by going online to vermont211.org, that's Vermont spelled out, 211.org, or by calling 211. A word about shelters. The two American Red Cross shelters in Barrie and Lindenville will be on standby status as of this afternoon. If people impacted by flooding need housing, they should call 211. It's important to note that these shelters can be scaled up or down based on need. The State Emergency Operations Center remains active. We continue to encourage local emergency management directors to reach out when needs exceed local capacity. Requests from the field have slowed down in the second half of the week, but we are still receiving and adjudicating requests for assistance. We are here 24 hours a day. We have emergency management staff working directly with the hardest hit communities. This includes on-site visits and regular phone and email communication to ensure that towns know how to access the resources they need. Our fire safety inspectors continue to be available to conduct safety inspections quickly. And as the governor mentioned, our staff is working with FEMA on the initial assessment to see if we qualify for public assistance. Next week, we will work with FEMA representatives to determine if any counties qualify for individual assistance. I'd like to wrap up by acknowledging how stressful and frustrating it can be to have to deal with flooding and damage to your home or your community. Not to mention the sadness we all feel when lives are lost in a natural disaster. It's hard to be one of those impacted by flooding. It's also hard to be a helper or responder in these circumstances. Fatigue and feelings of helplessness or anxiety are common following a natural disaster, or any disaster. No matter who you are or what pressures you face, there is help available if you want to talk to someone or be connected to resources. It is OK not to be OK. And that goes for the media, too, who has to keep seeing these things and hearing from people over and over. So please, reach out if you need support. The following resources are available to all Vermonters. 988, the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline is available 24-7. You can call or text 988 for crisis support or if you are worried about a loved one who you think might need assistance. There is also the Disaster Distress Hotline. This hotline provides free confidential counseling and support to people in distress due to natural and human-made disasters. The Disaster Distress Hotline number is 800-985-5990. You can call or text 24-7. There are numerous other resources available across the state. These two hotlines are a great starting point. The most important thing is that you reach out for help if you need it. Thank you, and I will turn things over to Secretary Moore from the Agency of Natural Resources. Good morning. I want to spend a few minutes this morning on landslides, uh, starting by acknowledging that landslide hazards can be very difficult to predict. Unlike floods, there isn't necessarily a straight, straight line connection between rainfall and landslides. However, a growing body of Vermont-specific work indicates that three to five inches of precipitation can trigger failures that lead to landslides, particularly when the ground is already saturated. And so given the amount of rain that much of central Vermont experienced 
over the last two weeks, up to 12 inches in some places. It's not unexpected that over the last several days, we have received a number of calls reporting fissures in the ground surface and visible cracks, sometimes referred to as tension cracks, that are appearing in the areas hardest hit by these storms. For example, in Plainfield, we have evaluated a number of new landslides along the Great Brook that were likely initiated as a result of high river flows, as well as revisiting sites that were identified following last year's rains in this same community. And while currently there are no known sites in Plainfield that present acute landslide risk to structures or roads, there are several locations we are carefully monitoring and we do know that landslides contributed additional sediment and large woody debris to flood flows. I share this as an example because of the potential direct risk landslides present to structures and roads, as well as the indirect lit risk from landslide-related sediment and debris and flood flows, making it important for us at ANR to understand where these cracks are forming so that we can track patterns and, when necessary, monitor changes over time. We've created a simple form on our flood website, anr.vermont.gov flood, where you can report landslide concerns for the state geologist to review. That said, if you believe a landslide risk or a landslide risk is presenting an imminent threat to your home or business, you should immediately leave the structure and call 911. Shifting gears, I want to provide brief updates on the agency's response to other aspects of the flood and urge Vermonters to continue to reach out for assistance from our teams. The agency continues to aid towns, property owners, and Vermonters across the state. Since last week's flood, the spills response team has received more than 30 reports of flood-related spills. The geology team has fielded more than a dozen reports of landslide activity and continues to make daily site visits to assess impacted properties. The waste management team is working with flood impacted towns to assess and support their needs for flood trash removal and disposal of contaminated materials. The Rivers program is providing direct technical assistance to towns and property owners on requests for stream bank stabilization, repairs to damaged stream crossing structures like bridges and culverts, and removal of accumulated sediment and other flood debris. Four state parks remain closed, all within the Groton State Forest, and Maidstone State Park continues to have reduced operations. Before you venture out this weekend to camp, hike, or swim, please check the state park's website or trail finder for the latest information on closures. In addition, there are five boil water notices that are in effect um, these are limited to the communities of Barnet and Plainfield and impact different areas of their water systems. And in a bit of good news, the Waterbury Dam floodgates were fully opened earlier this week, concluding flood operations at the reservoir. In addition, the dam safety program has visited over 20 dams since last week's storm and continues to see only minimal damage. As we continue forward in our recovery efforts, we urge Vermonters to continue to seek assistance from the agency. You can report spills of oil, fuel, or other hazardous materials as a result of flooding by calling 802-828-1138. If you're concerned that erosion may impact structures on your property, please first contact 211 and then visit our website for an additional form. And as you clean up after the flood, we encourage you to try to separate out hazardous materials from other flood debris. And finally, if you need to do work within a stream or river or on a river bank, please contact the Rivers Program. 
contact information for all Agency of Natural Resources programs is available at anr.vermont.gov slash flood. And with that, I'll turn it back over to the governor for questions. Thank you, Secretary Moore. Open up to questions. Um, sort of very similar to last year. The people in Plainfield are saying a lot of what the people in Montpelier did, why aren't we getting more help from the state? They're calling the Emergency Operations Center and they're saying that they're very helpful and knowledgeable, but they just don't have the staff that um, this, this tiny little community with a lot of volunteers needs to even know how to address the needs of the people um, still, you know, a week later. Just just things like food and hygiene and um, answering questions. They 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 just are wondering whether the state is going to set something up in the future to help community tiny little communities like this. Yeah, as I understand it, uh, and Eric might be able to address this further. Um, but I, th I do believe that we arrange for Callis, um, the EMD, uh, the Emergency Management Director at, in Callis, uh, to come and assist Plainfield um, because they didn't have the damage that Plainfield did. Uh, so they're going to go in and assist them. We are, um, we have had numerous uh, state officials going to Plainfield and we're doing what we can would, to assist. They would say those were sort of like photo ops. I mean, they, that's how they describe um, those visits from the state. Yeah, when I went, um, there were no cameras there. So uh, I talked directly with the community, community members, uh, seeing whatever we could do to assist them. So we are, we are not um, leaving Plainfield behind by any stretch, but. Be happy to take that. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> so I, I'm always a little hesitant when they are invoked, so I would start by saying that if, if anyone in Plainfield in the town officials are dissatisfied with the level of service that the state or the Emergency Operations Center is providing, they can contact me directly. I'm very easy to find. You hadn't heard that. Uh, what's that? You hadn't heard that. No, not at all. In fact, we don't have any open tickets. No, no requests have gone unfulfilled in Plainfield at this point. The governor mentioned that we set up a bit of a mentorship or a force multiplier with the emergency management director in Plainfield by, by having the EMD from, I'm going to say it wrong, Callis, uh, come in and help out. Uh, we also have assigned a, a direct person from the State Emergency Operations Center to not only be on site, but to be in regular daily phone contact with the emergency management director. Um, so we know where the hardest hit communities are, and we have assigned a personal liaison for those towns so that they have one-stop shopping. I think, I don't know this to be true in Plainfield, but what we experienced last year is that sometimes there was not agreement inside the town uh, about what the most urgent needs are, and sometimes there was disagreement perhaps with things either not being elevated to the SEOC through the EMD or uh, other things. So I would love to dive into that if you want to direct me to someone who's dissatisfied, but we don't have any open tickets. We're unaware of any unmet needs in Plainfield, and we are 100% ready to lean in with uh, assisting them with whatever they have for unmet needs at this point. Um, so again, we, we have a system set up so that the town speaks with one voice to the SEOC, which is through the emergency management director. If, there are, if they includes other people in the penumbra, it, it might be that they're not all uh, necessarily having visibility into what is being elevated to the SEOC. Yeah, let's trade info afterwards. All right, for sure. I'm, I'm easy to find, but I'll get you a card. Is there anything that I missed, Eric? Mm -hmm. Okay. Governor, uh, at this time last year, it seems like, I could be wrong, but FEMA was already doing individual assessments. They were already boots on the ground. Um, you know, the President Biden, I believe, had already declared a major disaster declaration. Yeah. I mean, do, do you get a sense that it's maybe moving a little slower and so it's, it's It's moving at a normal pace at this point. I think what we saw uh, last year was abnormal in some respects. Um, they were anticipating this storm. Uh, many calls uh, to FEMA. I, I spoke with the President. Um, there, there were a lot of touch points along the way in anticipation of what we were about to receive. Um, so I, I think this is just the normal process. And, and I have to remind even myself uh, that um, while it seemed like 
a month ago this flood happened. It was like six days ago. And uh, it's been, you know, a long six days in some respects, um, and especially for those who are dealing with it on the ground. But, um, but I think this is the normal process. And again, FEMA responded on the normal process. Um, they're going to finish their assessment, we're told, on Monday, and then uh, start doing the individual assistance assessment after that. We've been following up with Lola's question from earlier this week, but like given the damage that we've seen so far, those 1,200-ish so damage reports, do you expect uh, individual assistance? Like, are, do you think we're going to meet that threshold? It's, it's really hard to say um, because the, the formula is a bit more complicated. Um, so we'll, we'll just have to wait, wait and see. Um, you know, I'm concerned about the individual assistance since some some counties more than others. Uh, when I went to Addison, there's definitely damage uh, in Addison County through Starksboro and so forth, um, but not as much to individual homes uh, as in other areas. So it depends on where you are. Peachum got hit hard in their, in their downtown area, so to speak, in the village. Um, but I don't know how many of the homes were hit there. So. Again, it's going to it's going to depend on the community. Do you have any figures yet that um, uh, comparative figures this year versus um, we we last did year? Um, we did receive some and it seems seems like there's more this year uh, in two one one um, sheer numbers, but over a period of days. Um, We'll have to look at the, the aggregate amount when we're done, and it may be just people more accustomed to using 211 than they were a year ago. Um, but Eric could address that. Yeah, comparatively, five days in last year, they were at like 350 folks that had called 211, and now we're at you know 1,900. So, but we feel like that's mostly indicative of the fact that it's now socialized for them to call immediately, and they understand what they need to do. And those are the numbers that we then use to move to FEMA. So, you know, we're seeing some high numbers of houses that have significant damage or maybe destroyed, and those are the numbers that we're pushing to FEMA to really try to make sure that we get that IA declaration. But again, like the governor said, it's a it's a complex formula so we're providing them with as much data and as much as we can do uh, to, to, to try to get that threshold I know earlier in the week uh, you had reported about 50 homes self-reported uninhabitable or residential structures has that number been updated yeah, using DFS inspections, uh, American Red Cross did some assessments using 211 data and using our local, our initial local liaison. Uh, we're closer up to about 150 homes that are significantly damaged or destroyed, and that's the number that we're using with FEMA to uh, work through the IA process. Thank you. Does that mean like 150 I individuals, families displaced, or are people still living in these homes? Like what's and there's the rub. Uh, yeah. it's, it's all about how they define it. So we really won't know the final answer until FEMA literally goes into that building and looks at that structure. So as defined by FEMA, it's flooding onto your first floor. But if you have a bedroom in the basement, there's some nuances there. So really, we're working through that number. We're erring on the side of uh, higher just to make sure that we get as much um, inspections as we can. How are we also doing on space at the landfill, given last summers, floods, we're going to have flood cleanup this time around, like there was an expansion a few years ago. Where do we stand with that? I believe uh, there is still capacity. I haven't heard of any any issues with the Coventry landfill, but nothing. nothing we've heard, at least. But there doesn't seem to be as much of that type of debris in this storm as it was because of Montpelier's damage and so forth. Uh, when might we know if we've hit that that threshold, the major disaster threshold? Um, I, I believe um, when they finish their assessment on Monday, I, th I think we'll know uh, within, by, I'm thinking next week, but that's what we're anticipating. Maybe just like based on what, what you've seen um, and what your folks have seen, like how, you, how do you compare this to last year's? What, what does it look like to you? I t tried to describe this the other day. Um, it's it's somewhat of a because I saw I was 
involved with Irene, as well as last year's storm, and it's like a combination of the two. Uh, Irene was um, was over in like one day. We, we received an incredible amount of rain in a short period of time. Did substantial damage to our transportation infrastructure throughout the state and, and homes and communities as well. But this, a year ago, um, we had we had a lot of rain, but then we kept getting more rain and more rain. And we had a lot of flooding, you know, rising water instead of rushing water. Um, and this storm, depending on the community you were in, had a, a tremendous amount of rushing water, uh, a high velocity, cutting through a lot of uh, road infrastructure, transportation, bridges, and so forth, maybe on a smaller scale than Irene, but somewhat of a combination between the two storms um, is the way I, I think about it. What do we know about impacts from the Microsoft outage uh, issues? Uh, has, to what degree has state government been impacted? Yeah, I, we have our Deputy Secretary of the Agency of Digital Services here. She can describe. Thank you, Governor. <clears throat> I'm happy to answer that. Uh, right now, we learned about this issue around 6.30 this morning, and we have assessed that approximately 10% of state systems have been impacted. Since that time at 6.30, we brought approximately 25% of those back online, and we anticipate having that resolved, hopefully, uh, the bulk of those, if not maybe a few outliers by the end of the day. Um, we are prioritizing security, public safety, flood recovery, vulnerable remonters, and in terms of how we bring things back online. What what systems are like is, are still impacted? Is it individual departments within state governments or pro computer programs you guys are using? Like so departments what, and agencies within state government are impacted. For example, um, you've probably seen in the media already that um, some folks couldn't access email, things like that. But what we email. But what we do know is that 211 and 911 were not impacted. So I think that's important to share. Any other public facing things that, you know, uh, were perhaps disrupted? Not that we're aware of. Websites are not impacted at this time. Um, again, if things evolve, we would keep folks up to date, but not at this time. This has had a, a really big ripple effect on society. I mean, even in the news, we were dealing with it, airports, hospitals. Maybe this is a question for the governor, too. But like, how do we, you know, as we move forward over the next 10, 20 years here, where do we put resources in state government to build out state IT? Like, how do we prepare for this? Yeah, I, I think we as a nation have to learn from this experience as well. Um, I sit, sit on the Council of Governors, uh, and we have five Republicans, five Democrats who advise the Department of Defense and interrelate uh, with them, but also Homeland Security. And this would fall along that uh, in those lines as well. So um, I'm sure we'll be talking about it at our next meeting. But from my standpoint, I think um, duplication, redundancy, um, not putting all our eggs in one basket, I think it's going to be important. As we learned today, uh, all of these were affected by, it appears, um, through, um, and, and this wasn't a, a cybersecurity event, um, but it was through CrowdStrike, um, anything attached to that, when the upgrades to that, it seems as though that impacted states in different ways. So I think, again, we as a society have to learn how we have handle redundancy and make sure that we have another process in place so that we aren't impacted across the board. Is there a role like for the federal government to step in to like regulate this more? I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, like when the, uh, you know, the, the state Medicaid service, the change healthcare went offline, that had a huge impact on, on Vermonters, one company that suffered a breach. Um, I mean, is there a role, I know it's beyond Vermont here, but like, is there a role for, for regulators or the federal government to, to step in to try to alleviate this? Well, again, anytime we're talking about anything to do with our homeland security, um, 
it's a national issue. And I think that we have an obligation to make sure uh, that, uh, that we have steps in place that will better protect us overall. And again, I, I and, and I'm, I'm not um, an IT whiz by any stretch, but I, I don't believe that we should be dealing with one company in particular across the board because you're only as strong as your weakest, weakest link. And if, um, if that link breaks and we are all uh, using the same system, uh, we'll be in trouble. And uh, we have to just make sure that we prepare for that. Anything you want to add to any of that? I think the only thing I'll clarify is that this was this is not considered at this point in time not considered a cybersecurity event. So that's really different than the change healthcare incident. Just wanted to clarify that. And, and just last follow up question. Sorry to talk too much about IT. Um, there was also recently a, a an incident with AT and T and cell phones and call logs, text messages, et cetera, being leaked. Do you know if that was state government, state employees, were they impacted in that as well? I'm not aware that we were impacted by that. Going back to FEMA, but to when they were here for Stowe last Tuesday, do we have any updates on where that is? It's still in progress. Yeah, still in progress. For the landslides, did you say there were about a dozen? And I'm just wondering if we know tell us like where the hotspots were and uh, if how many homes uh, were impacted. Sure. Um, so it is about a dozen reports. Uh, they're still continuing to come in. Uh, there are four or five, and I'm happy to follow up with you with, with specifics about the places where, where landslides have actually occurred as opposed to these tension cracks having opened. Um, but the, the most significant concerns, I believe, are in um, Barton, Peachum, um, and some concerns in Plainfield as well. Uh, but we're continuing to receive reports, and um, the team is in the field, so I suspect that'll be updated. But if you'd like, I can get you details on the ones we've specifically documented at this point. Thank you. All right, we'll go to the phones. Ed Barber, Port Daily Express. Ed is like trying to get back in, and I'm trying to admit him. So, yeah, hello. Can you hear me? Go ahead, Ed. Yeah, uh, my question is for for to file uh, uh, to FEMA a uh, damage report uh, for people on homeowners. Um, if there's people who are not up here that they're traveling out of state or out of country or they have a secondary home up here and they might not come up till August. Is there any uh, deadline uh, where they can file for FEMA for damages caused by the storm? Well, right now, I'll let uh, others answer uh, this, but we haven't received the declaration yet, so there's no filing at this point. Uh, we're asking people to report to 211, which is a separate process than for filing with FEMA. So we just want to make that perfectly clear. So as we work through the trying to get the emergency, um, sorry, the major disaster declaration, uh, once we receive that, then FEMA will come to the state uh, like they did last year, stand up the disaster recovery centers for individual citizens to go sign up for FEMA to go to their location and inspect their homes and fill out the paperwork. So those uh, processes will go once we get the major disaster declaration. And there is a deadline, but they do have waivers, right? If there's an Correct. exceptional circumstance. There will be deadlines. Uh, They're just not set yet. Would there be a deadline? They will be able to submit a request to visit the property online, but they will need to be someone there to show them the property. Okay. But there, there won't, is, when, if there is a declaration, is there still, is there going to be a deadline yes. to be able to file? Yes, there will be a deadline. Once the major disaster declaration is set, uh, then they begin the process of the inspections. There will be an eventual deadline that uh, applications have to be submitted by. It's usually a couple that, months. That, that deadline will be announced uh, later? Absolutely. Okay. Very good. That's all I have. Thank you. Ed, you also mentioned uh, second homeowners, and, and I believe the individual assistance is just for the residents. 
Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Governor, I heard a commercial jetliner go over a little over my head a little while ago. Do you know if there's any um, business or non-governmental impact from the IT outage? I am not aware of any. To governmental? Non-governmental. Oh, non-governmental. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Maybe just repeat the question again, if you would, please. Uh, if there's there was any impact on private businesses or anything like that, the idea. I'm sure there was. What we do know right now, uh, and actually this is largely public information, is that banks and airlines were heavily impacted. Um, in terms of what's happening here in Vermont, I would recommend if folks, if organizations are a CrowdStrike customer, that they reach out to CrowdStrike for guidance and next steps. Okay, and, and quickly, Governor, any, any um, reaction to the unemployment report that came out today, which was also impacted by, the reporting was impacted by the IT outage, but any reaction? There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of uh, change there. Yeah, I mean, yeah. steady as we go in some respects, uh, the 2.1 percent unemployment rate being one of the lowest in the in the nation. I think we're maybe third or fourth, and certainly in the Northeast, um, some would be thinking that's a positive sign. I look at it a different way as we have in the past, and and we still have more jobs and we have people to fill them workforce challenges still are a challenge for us. So we'll, um, again, no news is good news. I guess it's better than having a high unemployment rate, but, um, but we still have a lot of work to do. Thank you, Governor. Back to the room. Did you get to watch the President's uh, acceptance speech last night? I did not. Just overall thoughts on now that the convention is, is finished, the party is coalesced around the former president. Uh, any, any thoughts just on where it landed? Um, no, I mean, it's uh, certainly uncertain times in many respects. Uh, the president now is being questioned, uh, is the competency, and, uh, and we have a surging uh, candidate, a former president, running. So it's a, certainly an interesting time for all of us. Do you think Joe Biden should step down? I, um, when I saw the debate, and I think I said this during one of the press briefings, but it confirmed my feelings about both candidates. I didn't think either candidate should be running for office or were fit for office, but for much different reasons. Um, I've seen the decline in President Biden in his, his health, um, and I, I think he should, it's obviously his decision to make, but, um, but I think he, he should step aside. I don't think he's competent to serve another four years. If he does stay on the ticket, will you vote for him? I, I don't think so. Thank you all.